Andy has never seen this movie before and I'm really excited for him right now. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the latest episode of Real History. I am your host, Jared Frederick, and I have a real favorite of mine coming up tonight, and that is Sam Mendez's film from 2002, which is entitled Road to Perdition, starring an all-star cast, including Tom Hanks, Paul Newman, Jude Law, and some great character actors. Uh, this is a a, a fictitious film in a historical sense, but it has a lot of really uh, rich uh, historical background that I think has a lot of historical truth to it. And it, it's really deep in its authenticity. And for that reason, I've decided to take a look at it this evening. For all intents and purposes, this is a gangster film that is set in 1931 Chicago, but in a deeper sense, it is also a story about family, particularly that of father and son. And the theme of family is one that is very important during the years of the Great Depression in the United States, uh, whether we are looking at The Grapes of Wrath or other semi-fictitious tales much like this. Uh, family is absolutely central. And for that reason, I think Road to Perdition deserves our attention. So, without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. There are many stories about Michael Sullivan, but I once spent six weeks on the road with him in the winter of 1931. Okay, so right out of the gate, I have to you know, confess a little bit of nostalgia associated with this film. Um, my dad was born the same summer as Tom Hanks. I was born the same month as Tyler Hecklin, who plays him, his son in this movie. And so uh, these characters, they are the, the exact same age as my dad and I when we went to see this film together in the summer of 2002. And we were the only two people in the whole theater, in the whole auditorium. And so like, it's a very like fond, nostalgic memory um, of my childhood as I was like kind of transitioning uh, into my latter teenage years. Uh, and so, yeah, a little bit of nostalgia indeed. One of the things that I absolutely love about this film from a historical perspective is the material culture. I mean, just uh, walking into the, the drugstore here, you know, you see the lucky strikes on the counter, you see all the, the ointments and tonics on the shelves, you see the, the period authentic candy and razor blades. Uh, the production designers just did such a fantastic job capturing early 1930s Chicago in these opening scenes. It really helps us to, to set our, our mindsets and, and get in the mood of these characters. Sam Mendes made this film uh, shortly after he won an Academy Award for uh, American Beauty. And of course, uh, in my mind, aesthetically speaking, in its historical context, uh, this film is also a brick in the foundation that leads to one of his, his masterworks, and that is 1917, which we have also checked out here on Real History, our inaugural episode, in fact. So check out that too. Mm -hmm. Dinner's ready. Thank you. Tom Hanks, of course, better known as America's dad. You know, a, a lot of people liken him to Jimmy Stewart. And I think that carries a lot of truth. Because these are two actors known for their nice guy, aw shucks demeanor, in the first half of their careers. Um, and then, after World War II... Jimmy Stewart takes on darker roles. And then after a World War II movie, Saving Private Ryan, Tom Hanks takes on darker roles. Um, and this was really one of the first such films in which he was doing this, where his characters took on a darker moral complexity. Uh, and so uh, it, it, it's very different from Tom Hanks' films of just years prior.
The exterior of the Rooney household that we just saw is a real-life historical building. It's called the Howe Mansion, and I believe it's in Evanston, Illinois. Uh, and, you know, that was from, you know, one of these, you know, very wealthy, uh, you know, elite families uh, that lived in the, the broader Chicago area here in the first half of the 20th century. And you can actually go visit this household as a museum today. And I, I didn't realize it until fairly recently, but throughout this film, uh, water is often a harbinger of death. Whenever there is water, somebody has just died or somebody is about to die. I've, I've watched this movie so many times over the past 20 years and didn't realize that till recently. And it kind of plays on this thematic device because usually water is a sign of life and rejuvenation. Uh, but in this film, it is very much the opposite. Yeah! Yeah! Winner! Call the cops! I know a hostage when I see him. Upstairs. Jacket pocket in my study. Before I change my mind. A fun little bit of connective Hollywood history here. Um, this was the final movie uh, that was shot by this really masterful cinematographer by the name of Conrad Hall. And Hall really was able to to, to find and use all of these old industrial landscapes in the Chicago area to help bring this story to life. And he would win an Academy Award, but unfortunately, he would receive it posthumously. Um, he died just a few months after um, this film finished wrapping. Um, but at an earlier phase of his life, he was also the cinematographer for Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, which starred... Paul Newman, who is also in this film. So some fun uh, tie-ins that we see here. What do you want? Mr. Rooney sent me to get his jacket. You come back later, huh? I'm busy. This was also the first movie that I saw Daniel Craig in. And uh, here, too, it shouldn't come as any surprise to us that Sam Mendes would later direct him, you know, in the likes of Skyfall and these Bond films. Uh, but he, he leaves such an impression in this film. It's little wonder that he, he caught the eye of, of casting directors years later as Bond. Let's drink to Danny's honor. Let's wake him to God and hope that he gets to heaven at least an hour before the devil finds out he's dead. John Rooney's character is loosely based off of a real-life historical personality by the name of John Looney. And Looney was uh, essentially uh, you know, the, the chief, the boss of this area of Illinois that was known as Rock Island. And, uh, you know, Looney, um, who w was really in power about a decade before this film is set in the, the early 1920s, was the, the peak of his power. Um, but he had a, a tabloid newspaper that was called the, the Rock Island News. And this was often used as a front uh, for his uh, shady business dealings. And it was also a means of embarrassing or even blackmailing uh, some of his uh, opponents and foes. Uh, so he was a, a very uh, canny and shrewd individual in this regard. And Paul Newman's character is loosely based off him. <laughs> We see a, a traditional, good old-fashioned Irish wake uh, playing out here, uh, you know, and this is a, in many ways kind of a, a lost heritage in the, the rituals of mourning in the United States today. Uh, but, you know, these were opportunities to uh, celebrate one's life as well as to, you know, uh, grieve. And you know, they weren't always, you know, somber ceremonies. There were moments of, of reflection and meditation throughout, of course, uh, but, you know, not everything was, was, was tears and tragedy. Sometimes even the president sends him on missions because Papa was a war hero and all. What we see Michael paging through here uh, is a book much like this. Uh, I have one in my own collection. 
and this was part of the Better Little Book series. Uh, and these, of course, were marketed to youth in the 1930s and the 1940s. And these were exceedingly popular little products that worked really well for younger audiences because they could put them in their backpacks, they could put them in their coat pockets. Um, and you know, they were kind of a, a contemporary equivalent to comic books uh, as well. Um, this one is called Fighting Heroes. It, it dates to the, the years of the Second World War. Uh, but it has all these, you know, great little illustrations and, and stories in them, uh, much like we see the character of Michael going through right here. So it's an, another nice little, you know, bit of uh, material culture that we see being incorporated into the movie. We're just talking to him, right? Sure. <laughs> here it's raining. <laughs> Not a good sign. The car that our characters are driving in is that 1931 Buick sedan, and it had a, a nice little trunk under the back seat that we see Michael Jr. Uh, hiding away in here. Um, so in my mind, this speaks to the affluence that uh, the Sullivan family has. Uh, you know, he has a brand new car. He works for this well-to-do family. And this is during a time when most people can't afford a solid meal, let alone a new car. And so it, it speaks to the very comfortable status that the Sullivan family lives in, that Tom Hanks' his, uh, family can afford as such. To protect my family and keep my job, I'll stay quiet. But don't think I don't know something's going on. And don't think I won't find out what it is. You can all guess what's in those barrels. Uh, even though Prohibition starts right after the First World War, the early 1920s uh, is when it, it really takes off in earnest. The end of Prohibition is still over two years away. It would not end until 1933 when Franklin Roosevelt takes office. And so there's still two years of all this bootlegging um, and Ill illegal and illicit swindling here uh, going on. He's my son. Well, that's good enough for me. You take him home. Take a walk. Perfect night for a stroll. You know, the, the unusual thing is I didn't even know Daniel Craig was British until he was hired as James Bond because this was pretty much the only thing that I'd seen him in. <laughs> you can't protect him forever. If it wasn't this, it'd be something else. Natural law. One can only imagine, you know, just how many children in the greater Chicago area during this time were exposed to these levels of violence. And of course, all of this was fomented uh, by prohibition, this, this, this moral crusade that was meant to cleanse, you know, America of its, of its sins connected with alcohol. And of course, it does quite the opposite and creates this, you know, underground uh, industry of of, of bootlegging and speakeasy operations. And of course it leads to intensified gang warfare. Uh, we have the, the St. Valentine's Day Massacre in 1929. And that, that's just the most famous of many, many instances of these you know, hit jobs uh, going on uh, among the, the various gangs vying for control of the city. So uh, children were exposed to these things. Uh, there, there's really no other way around it. And part of that has to do with the fact that so many people were involved in uh, bootlegging uh, that it, it, the consequences of it were just inescapable. That's such a great shot. No word said, yet it, it conveys a message and it it, it, it forecasts, in a way, some of uh, the upheaval to follow. And I'm a grown man, and this place is getting to me. Every night there's trouble. There's some great sounds of the era here playing in the background. Uh, Chicago was very much on the jazz scene in the 1920s and the 1930s. So much of this stemmed from 
the Great Migration in which hundreds of thousands of African Americans seeking to, to flee the terrors of Jim Crow in the American South moved to places like Chicago, brought their music with them, the Delta Blues evolve into the Chicago Blues and the Chicago Jazz, and we kind of hear the byproduct of that playing out in these very colorful speakeasies as such. What I'm saying is, uh, is Mr. Rooney looking for anyone, you know, anyone like me, for example? There were perhaps thousands of speakeasies like this uh, all throughout Chicago, and as prohibition agents would try to, to shut them down, um, it was so often just a, a futile affair, uh, their efforts were, um, just because when, when one would close down one night, another one would just open up next door. Um, you know, it was just like a wildfire that kept spreading throughout the city. And it just uh, really bespoke the futility of trying to, to go after all of this and get a handle on it. I'm sorry. God damn you. God damn you! Who doesn't like seeing James Bond be beat up by an old man? <laughs> this house is not our home anymore. It's just an empty building. Thoughts of home are, are interesting to consider here in the context of 1930s America because so many Americans were losing their homes to, to banks. Uh, due to foreclosures because people couldn't pay off the mortgage because of the, the huge economic crash uh, that had commenced, you know, less than three years before uh, this movie is set. Uh, so, you know, the, the idea of losing your home due to, to violence and gang feuds uh, is something in, entirely different. This is one of my favorite shots in the whole movie. Uh, you know, not much of it is, is, is altered. All these buildings are still there. This architecture uh, is still there. Just need to do a little bit of set dressing. It speaks to uh, the benefits of historical preservation. Movies will come to your city to film there if you save your old structures. It pays to save. For instance, uh, the bridge that we see their Buick crossing here is the, the LaSalle Street Bridge. And it, it kind of evokes this very uh, distinctive art deco design, uh, a style of which you simply don't see in public spaces like this anymore. So some, some beautiful use of the scenery here. The exterior of the Hotel Lexington that we see here is actually uh, the Wrigley Building, which is located in Chicago. Um, but the interior is a, is a different building uh, altogether. Um, I believe it's uh, one of the, the Hilton Towers, uh, likewise located in Chicago. But uh, once again, just making use of what still exists. We all just heard what happened. Jesus, I'm sorry, Mike. Well, thank you for seeing me, Mr. Nitty. Frank Nitti was an Italian immigrant who was one of the ringleaders of the so-called Chicago outfit that was headed by Al Capone throughout the 1920s and into the early 1930s. And the film never references this, um, but Nitti had previously been one of Capone's bodyguards and he was, in actuality, also his first cousin. Um, and so, as the old saying goes, you know, blood runs thicker than water, and there are definitely family ties here uh, in, in this association within the Chicago outfit. What would you do if Sullivan were just some guy? Alliances were everything at this very harsh setting. You really get a sense of that in some of these conversations. Press. Press. He was raping my wife. He raped my wife. Come on, come on. You're treading on the evidence here. Slums and tenements like this were numerous uh, in Chicago during the Great Depression. 
Um, and in fact, there were housing riots um, in some instances. Uh, in 1931, there was uh, an older African American woman in her 70s um, by the name of Diana Gross, um, who was being evicted uh, by the Chicago Police Department. And her, her neighbors actually came to her aid to, to try to help keep her in her house. Um, and this, this led to a, a race riot of, of sorts in which a, a number of people were killed. Uh, and so once again, as I said earlier, um, the notion of uh, people being kicked out of their housing, even if it's substandard housing, much like we, we see here, um, these were just some of the many real and imminent threats of trying to survive during this really rocky era. Photographing slain corpses in the, the stoops and uh, gutters of Chicago could be a very lucrative endeavor for people like uh, the fictional McGuire here. Uh, because uh, if, if, if you could capture the right scene of the right mob personality, if you could uh, evoke enough uh, flavor and drama in your picture, uh, sensationalists and tabloid newspapers very might be willing to pay top dollar for them. Uh, and so it, it may not seem as an unusual way to make a living as it initially might suggest. On the photographs is mine. Hmm. No, never met him. But I know his work. I think this character of McGuire, this, this photographer turned bounty hunter, is a rather fascinating one. And when you think about his, his character's arc, I think of him as this man who has just been exposed to so much of this, this violence and this seedy underbelly in Chicago that he cannot help but be drawn into it and become part of that cycle of violence that he so diligently chronicles. What I always find interesting about movies like this, as well as uh, the, the, the inspiration for these mob-like characters that, that we see depicted, um, is that they're always church-going men. Uh, and you got to wonder, uh, do they go to church because they, they, they still have a hope that they might be able to redeem themselves, or do they go to church because that there's no chance that they're going to escape hell? <laughs> it's a kind of an interesting uh, spiritual question. We're on our way to your place, if that's all right. Of course. I'll be back there in two days. How's Michael? He's all right. I've taken an old phone like this into the classroom before, and I place it on a desk in front of a student, and I say, tell me how it works. And it's always interesting to see students of the modern era uh, try to uh, interpret and understand technology of the past. They're like, well, where are the keys? I'm like, well, there are no keys. Uh, and so, well, uh, those sorts of uh, interactions with artifacts are, are always fun in the classroom environment. The diner that we see here, in my mind, is very reminiscent of the diner that we see at the beginning of John Ford's The Grapes of Wrath, which, of, of course, is one of the most uh, searing and poignant uh, interpretations of life during the Great Depression and the Dust Bowl that, that overlapped with it. And at diners as such, a, a recurring would-be customer that often walked into such establishments uh, was a hobo. Uh, people would be walking across country roads like this, you know, they would have, you know, the sign around their neck or the, the saying on their lips, brother, can you spare a dime? And uh, people would often shuffle into to diners as such, hoping that they might be able to uh, appeal to the, the better nature or the charity of the waitress or the cook. And they might be able to get a meal, perhaps be able to get some table scraps uh, as a result. Uh, and so uh, these were the sorts of individuals that would wander in and out of these sorts of places when so many people were just down on their luck. Don't mind me, sir. It's a free country. 
in a lot of instances, it wasn't actually illegal to drink alcohol, only to, to sell, purchase, or transport it. Uh, so he, he possibly could have gotten away with uh, taking a swig as such. The, the pistol that we see Jude Law's character firing here is a Savage 1907, which fired a 32 caliber round. And uh, it was a handy little pocket pistol uh, for uh, some of the gunplay that happened in the greater Chicago area with much frequency. Yeah. That's for you. Call it a handling charge. Tell Chicago I took it. You know, there's a, there's a hint of truth uh, in these sorts of scenes, uh, kind of feeding into the mythos of the 1930s bank robber. Uh, because, you know, even though the, the likes of Bonnie and Clyde and John Dillinger uh, were nefarious criminals who killed people for profit and for personal gain, uh, there was nonetheless this Robin Hood-like quality to them that a lot of people found alluring. Because let's face it, uh, banks did not look good <laughs> uh, in regard to the, the Great Depression. In the minds of many Americans, banks were the ones responsible for causing the Great Depression in the first place. And it was banks who were helping to, to foreclose on people's houses and kicking them out of their homes. And, you know, and there was this mentality among some, you know, American readers that, yeah, like, you know, go get them. Like, go get those banks. Give them what's coming to them. Um, and so this movie, in a somewhat playful manner in these scenes, kind of uh, feeds into that, that mythical standing of the bank robber of this era. And you, Mr. Sullivan, have nothing to trade, especially not for anyone as valuable as Connor Rooney. I don't understand. Opening bell on Wall Street. There's another device that's gone the way of the dodo that I often have to explain to students. Uh, this was called a ticker tape device. Uh, and the paper that would slide through it and print small bits of data uh, could also be used for the famous ticker tape parades, the likes of which we see at the end of the Second World War. And so uh, those devices were really good for conveying you know, updates on Wall Street, uh, sports scores, uh, various news briefs, uh, kind of a, an early predecessor to, to texting or email. Indeed, those old steamer trunks could be very sturdy. These were meant to uh, withstand the, the rigors, the heavy rigors of, of railroad travel, ship travel, um, they were practically indestructible, and uh, they would sometimes be lined with uh, metal or lead, and so it, definitely in the realm of possibility that it would be able to stop a shotgun blast, whereas the drywall behind Sullivan would not be able to do so. The weather-worn appearance of this farmer's household, I think, really speaks to the plight of how so many Americans found themselves by, you know, the winter and the spring of 1931 when, when this film is set. And uh, Chicago in particular w was struck really hard by the Great Depression, uh, predominantly because it relied so heavily upon manufacturing and industry. And it was this horribly vicious cycle uh, which unfolded and, and struck the people of the greater Chicago area um, because if farmers like the ones we see here could no longer afford to buy machinery as a result of losing their savings, that means the factories producing them and the likes of Chicago would quit making them. And when they quit making them, they would shut down the factories and the factories would lay off its workers and the workers couldn't provide for their families. And there goes the neighborhood. And so that just kind of speaks to this, just th this economic vortex that people found themselves in. He's a good worker. You have me. 
there's a really famous photograph of a Chicago soup kitchen that was taken around this time and it's likewise a photograph that I like to show my students and it shows people, you know, waiting in a bread line, waiting to be fed. They're essentially lined up going around the block. And when I tell my students that this soup kitchen was funded, and it was overseen by none other than Al Capone, they're often curious as to why that was the case. Um, and, you know, as the old saying goes, are you going to bite the hand that feeds you? And by Capone pretending to be benevolent and charitable, he could strengthen and grow his own empire because none of those people that he's feeding are going to snitch on him. He can essentially buy their silence and buy their loyalty as a result. Um, and so then, as well as now, uh, these times of hardship could bring out the best and the worst of individuals. This is likewise a historic building. This is St. Sylvester Church, uh, located on Palmer Square. Uh, yet another building that actually existed uh, during the time period of this film. The Thompson submachine gun, yet another uh, piece of weaponry that was a, a byproduct of the First World War. Uh, became rather ubiquitous in Chicago during uh, Prohibition in the early years of the Great Depression, uh, so much so to the extent that it became known as the Chicago typewriter. Uh, for when it was fired, it had that rather staccato sound that a keyboard on a typewriter uh, very well may have had. And it was ideal... Uh, for gangsters in these sorts of uh, circumstances um, because they could remove the wood stock and that would allow them to have a maximum range of motion and flexibility and to be able to easily conceal it in a big open pocket or underneath their trench coat. Uh, and so uh, the likes of Sullivan and Capone's minions and so, so many more made uh, very active and lethal use of this weaponry later on made even more famous during the Second World War. Covering fire! Cinematographer Conrad Hall was very much inspired by the works of American painter Edward Hopper. And if you think about paintings like Night Owls, um, and kind of these, uh, these, these depression era streetscapes in which people are wearing fedoras and trench coats. You can definitely see the, the influence in scenes like this. I'm glad it's you. Nothing like using a whole drum on your surrogate father. I understand. But then Al wants your assurance that after that, it's over. Interestingly enough, it nearly was over for Nitty and Capone because this movie is set just months before these two guys are nabbed on income tax evasion. Uh, Nitty ends up spending, uh, he, he's sentenced to, I believe it was 18 months in jail and Capone was sentenced to 11 years in jail. I believe that was October 1931. And so this is kind of the final hurrah for the Capone organization as it once was. And after Capone ended up in prison and ended up dying later on, uh, Nitty was, was the guy, he was the heir apparent who assumed a lot of this, this power in coordination for the Chicago outfit. So the end of an era here that we uh, get a sense of in these scenes. In real life, there was a Connor Looney, and he was assassinated. Um, however, he was assassinated while he was in a car with his father 10 years before this, and his dad ended up living well over another 20 years past his son. 
Um, and so, you know, the, the inspiration uh, for these characters, uh, you know, it, the reality departs significantly from what we see in, in this film. And, of course, it doesn't claim to actually be those individuals, so a little bit of flexibility is understandable. There's, a, there's speculation among some historians that uh, Tom Hanks' character might be an amalgamation of uh, one of the, the, the Looney's minions, a guy by the name of Dan Drost, who actually orchestrated the hit on Connor Looney in 1922. And so the, the plot of this film kind of turns the tables on the character in regard to who hits who first. And here they have finally reached perdition. And of course, in a biblical sense, perdition is a euphemism for hell, the road to hell. Let's see where it leads them. Even though we're the same age, Tyler Hecklin's definitely aged better than me. <laughs> He's Superman now. The recurring theme of this gang warfare landscape is, is that nobody could escape the violence. What goes around comes around, and unfortunately that's kind of one of the conclusion themes of this film. Come on. Give me the gun. The fact that they're by water, that the room is all white, dead giveaway for what was about to happen. When people ask me if Michael Sullivan was a good man, I always give the same answer. I just tell them, he was my father. This is such a fantastic film. In my mind, it's not only one of the best gangster films of, of that genre, um, but it's also such a fantastic and rich depiction of life in America in the 1930s. Um, there's just so many great period details, and you know they they filmed it all on location, and they walked in the footsteps of where uh, people like this and the real life characters uh, went about their their everyday lives. Um, this was a, a production that just really did its homework and excelled in that regard. And while the movie does not uh, focus on many. Uh, true-to-life individuals, I think that there's a lot of true-to-life themes that one can find in this motion picture. It is a fairly clear-cut plot. It is a story of redemption. It's a story of revenge, and all told, it is a story about family. And these are some universal themes that I think make the film very appealing in all of these regards. Um, so, something a little bit different uh, in this episode of Real History, but we're nonetheless hoping that you gain something uh, useful out of it as a result. So, until next time, we'll see you on Real History. <laughs>